All right, we're doing uh, First Peter. We're studying First Peter. Uh, Peter, I'd like us to uh, dig down pretty deep in verses one through, or excuse me, six through twelve of chapter one, and talk about worthy of trial and affliction. Peter is giving us his first warning about prosecution, persecution, trials that are going to take place for Christians in the first century. And of course, there's a message for uh, us as well. All right. My clicker is not working. There we go. First Peter chapter one and verse six, and this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials. In this text, Peter is uh, showing us the agony and the ecstasy. Uh, They hold hands in this sentence, if you will. Uh, Do you see it? Do you hear the vocabulary? In this you rejoice. When's the last time that you rejoiced when you were suffering about something? Praise and glory and honor. Again, rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. But you also have uh, the antagonistic part as well. You have the opposite of this. Grieved as a result of the trials. Various trials are going to come tested by fire. I'm not sure that I like the sound of that. Tested by fire. Sounds like we're going to go through something that could be uh, quite tumultuous. <clears throat> yes. Marshall, I can actually say that I did rejoice. Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh huh. Then you. In your rejoicing, praise and glory and honor. Yeah. But you still had some grieving to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good example. Notice he says, in this you greatly rejoice even though now for a little while. This is Peter's first allusion to persecution. Remember, Peter is writing to Christians. We're not talking about non-Christians here and things that happen to them. We're talking about Christians. There's two ways to discuss this. Number one, there's general trials that all of us suffer in life. And number two is there are specific trials related to being a Christian, things that happen to us because we're children of God. And I think that the emphasis here that Peter is using is specific trials that Uh, We suffer as a result of being Christians. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, Peter teaches us, number one, trials are inevitable. If you're a Christian, trials are going to come. They simply come. Number two, you're going to be grieved. Another Another way to translate that word is distressed. When you have trials come on you, you can be distressed about it, and you know what that feels like. Uh, And the contrast here, of course, is grieving versus rejoicing. Uh, When trials are there, uh, there's both real distress and authentic rejoicing that takes place, is what Peter is teaching us. And I think that this is, that Peter gives us a full and frank um, recognition that earthly trials are going to cause genuine mental distress. You're going to hurt in body and mind when you have trials come upon you, is his point. He says, greatly rejoice even though now for a little while. So what Peter does now is he's giving perspective to suffering. Um, First, sometimes it's thought that uh, a strong Christian will never be troubled with trials. Thank you for playing, but that's incorrect, okay? Strong Christians will be persecuted more than weak ones. Satan already has the weak ones. He's going after the strong ones. 
Remember, at the end of Peter, we're going to talk about that roaring lion that seeks to devour us. That's Satan, the devil, uh, the real individual personage, if you will, that brings persecution and tempts us with sin all the time. So just because you're a strong Christian ha, doesn't mean a thing. Satan is gonna go after everyone. Second, trials are necessary. I know you don't like to hear this. Trials are necessary. Trials prove that our faith is genuine, are genuine. You know, whenever they teach members of the Department of Treasury about counterfeiting, they don't show them counterfeit bills for the first couple of weeks. They train them to what a authentic, genuine $100 bill, $50 bill, $20 bill actually looks like down to minute detail. So that whenever they see one, they know what it looks like, a genuine one. They also know what a counterfeit looks like as well. Third, any suffering uh, we experience will be temporary. Think about it this way, because in comparison with eternity, what we're going through now, just a minute, just a moment. What does, um, what does James say in uh, James chapter one? We're just a fog, a mist that appears for a little while and then just dissipates. We're gone. I have a really, really good friend, Lisa and I do, She's a wonderful lady. She turned 98 this year. Uh, she's, I asked her, I said, how do you feel about that? She said, I'm hoping for 99. Uh, and she's been very gracious and given us master's tickets to go to the master's in Augusta, Georgia. Her family comes first, but if a family member gets sick, she gives me a call because I'm the substitute master's guy, which is really nice. But she gets her tickets to pay for them in January, and that's also her birthday. So we always tell her, we always pray for you to make it past January, Marilyn, <laughs> because then we know there's a chance we'll get to go to the Masters one more time. And she laughs about that. But uh, you know, in comparison, she's lived 98 years, and she says, you know what? It just seems like it's gone by that fast. <laughs> You talk to a teenager at 13, boy, it seems like, you know, I got so much to live. Well, maybe you do and maybe you don't. But compared to eternity, what we're going through now is uh, so much that proves our genuine faith, but it's so much less. It can make it less stressful if you think about it in comparison. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed to us. Boy, amen to that. For our light affliction. Now, Paul is talking about people that have been thrown to the lions. Paul is talking about people who have been beaten, chained, and thrown in jail. And he says, you're light affliction. That's light affliction compared to what? Compared to the eternity that you have as a result of the suffering. Uh, for the moment is working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen now. You know, we've got to get our minds only on the now so that we can survive because the now is not where it's at. The after is where the promises are. But the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, the word eternal in Greek, uh, the word ionios means into the ages of the ages, and it's a present tense, it's continual. Once eternity starts, it's going on, and we have to use the word forever, but the idea is continual, okay? Uh, if necessary, you've been grieved or distressed by various trials. Literally, trials mean 
many, uh, the word various means many colored, kind of like uh, Joseph's many colored coat, that idea. It also describes the skin of a leopard. If you've ever looked carefully, you got a lot of variation there. Different color veinings of marble. A lot of us have marble countertops in our kitchens and bathrooms now. And when you look at that, the different veinings of marble, that's what he's talking about when he talks about the kinds of trials, various trials that are coming. The word translated trials signifies affliction persecution or trial of any kind related to being a Christian that's what we're talking about here so in the first century let's take a look at what they went through number one in the first century you could be ostracized by your community it could be a local persecution it doesn't have to be uh, the Romans coming down with their uh, spears javelins and uh, and swords it can be the local group just ostracizing you. We're not going to buy your materials anymore that you're selling from your hardware store. We're not doing that. You could have increased in uh, taxation. Uh, Jews, of course, were a tolerated religion in the first century, and they were had increased taxation as well. Uh, loss of personal property. Uh, they could come and take your property from you. The government could. You could be thrown in prison. You could have physical persecution. Or you could later on, as we get further into, um, into the first century, and especially in the second century, a lot of executions took place as a result of you being a, a Christian. So for genuine Christian, trials are going to arrive in every possible size and shape, every form you can imagine. And yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Second Peter 3 and verse 12 is a powerful verse talking about this. So what does this mean? What's this verse really mean? All right, let's get real. Let's talk about this for a minute. What trials have you suffered directly as a result of being a Christian? The only reason why you suffered it is because you were a Christian. How many people here have ever lost their job as a result of being a Christian? Okay, we got one over here. You don't have to raise your hand. I had a good friend of mine, uh, Beth, who uh, was hired, got a really good job, and when they found out he was a Christian, he was fired the same day. We don't want those kind of people working here. Those kinds of people working here, yeah. Um, other, uh, other situations arise as well sometimes. Um, anyone here ever been physically threatened as a direct result of being a Christian? Physically threatened. Happened to me one time. I was door knocking for a bus program in the uh, mid-1980s, and I was in Lake Worth, Florida, which is the West Palm Beach area, Anybody here know what a cane cutter looks like? Because when you're in West Palm Beach, you're only 25 miles from the Everglades where they grow sugar cane. You know what a cane cutter looks like? It's like a machete, which is straight, only it's curved at the end, kind of a half moon kind of a thing, very sharp, and the workers bend down and cut it off about six inches from the ground. And uh, I was door knocking with a, uh, a fellow um, from our church. He was a deacon. His name's Richard. And... Um, we knocked on the door and the guy opened his screen door and showed his cane cutter and chased us back to the bus. <clears throat> I was never so glad to have a door of a bus close as I was that day when that actually happened. Anybody here ever been spit on because you were a Christian? <clears throat> there again, I was door knocking and Richard is the one that got spit on. The guy said, I don't want you in the neighborhood anymore. I don't want you talking to my kids about coming to church anymore. I'm not gonna come to your church Pluey, and he spit on Richard. And Richard is six foot five and weighs about 200 pounds. He's always been really skinny. Richard took out a handkerchief and wiped his face off and said, I'm sorry that you don't want to go to our church, and walked away. Whew. I'm not sure that I'm man enough to do that. I feel like punching somebody whenever they spit on me, you know? <clears throat> Uh, we all react in different ways, but the two of us just walked away doing that. Um, there are some times I will share with you that I have been very bold as a Christian. And there are some times I will share with you that I have been very cowardly as a Christian and walked away from situations that I should not have. I, I, I don't know what your life experience is, but I have been both. 
But the point is, if you live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution at some point in some way, simply because you're a child of God. It doesn't happen as often in the United States of America because we have laws that protect us. I'm grateful for that. But um, go to the Ukraine today and see how public worship works for you. People there in the Ukraine are being persecuted every day. Bombs are falling in their neighborhood from time to time and Christians are still meeting and they're still worshiping God and they're still inviting people to church. And uh, you know, and I'm sure some people have you know, rejected Christ as a result of that physical persecution, but there's a lot who haven't. So there are places in the world where if you're a Christian, it's not so easy. And that's what Peter's talking about here is this kind of thing. God has a purpose, not only for the trial, but also for the heavy grief that we feel as a result of that trial. For Christians, there's a spiritual benefit. Think about it this way. There's a benefit from trials. We can take delight in being distressed. Um, Romans chapter 5 is a really good verse that we can add to Peter here. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. What? Glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character produces hope. Tribulation is a really strong term and is not talking about minor inconveniences, but rather hardship as a result of being a Christian. First Peter 1 and verse 7 that genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold uh, that uh, perishes though it's tested by fire may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, proof of your faith. How can we prove our faith? The Greek phrase here refers to the approved residue of faith, that faith that is genuine. I had a friend in West Palm Beach who, when gold went crazy in the middle 80s, late 80s, became worth so much, he quit his job and started buying and selling gold. And he would, had a kiosk in a mall, and he would buy all the gold, and then he would bring it home, which I always thought was really dumb, but he brought it home, and in his garage, he had a kiln, and he would put the gold in there and melt it, and he would uh, skim off the dross on the top, the waste coming from, got as pure a gold as he could get in his garage. And he showed me how he did it one time. And it's extremely hot to be able to melt gold down and then be able to get the impurities to come out of it. But Peter says that the impurities have to be forced out of us as well. And the way you do that is by suffering trials. God's purpose in trials is to display the enduring quality of our faith. Um, and our faith is more precious than gold. Peter adds three, uh, I think, good perspectives here, or adds a third perspective to this. Um, uh, Christians can endure persecution because these trials will have a positive benefit. They'll require, or they'll, excuse me, reveal the quality of our faith. Also, um, gold is perishable. Whenever uh, Jesus comes back, everything is going to be burned up. We'll study that when we go in, in Peter. Uh, Peter actually uses the word atomize in the Greek. Uh, everything down to the atoms are going to be burned up. I love the uh, old uh, gospel preacher, Marshall Keeble. Uh, he was preaching a meeting in Texas and the, the, the rancher took him out and put him up on a hill and showed him all of his thousands of head of cattle and his big ranch barns and his hay that he had grown and stuff. And he says, Brother Keeble, what do you think about that? And Brother Keeble looked at him and said, the Lord's going to burn it all up one day. What a perspective, huh? To have that kind of perspective. It's all going to be gone. That's the now. What we're looking for is the eternal. So, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. Fire and heat, that is, uh, was and is used to burn away impurities. And so, to reveal the pure gold. In the same way, trials reveal the inner quality of our faith. Trials reveal 
I like this. Trials reveal what's already there. If you have genuine faith, it's going to be revealed. Uh, God is great an important purpose for our testing, our faith. Faith is tested to show genuine faith. Faith is tested to uh, show the strength of our faith. Faith is tested to purify it and burn away the dross, the waste from your faith. Um, gold is one of the most durable of all materials. I have gold in my mouth. Maybe some of you do too. I have had some gold that's been in my mouth for a very long time. Gold is durable. It lasts a long time. And it's perfect for uh, being malleable, for being chewed on. It works really well for that. And I'm grateful because, and uh, some of you are too, because we need to be able to chew up our food. You know, when you have missing teeth or teeth that hurt, it's really difficult to do. Gold is durable. Uh, yet it will one day perish. It's all going to go away. Gold can withstand fire uh, so that you can work out the dross from it. Peter says, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The end of our faith, brothers and sisters, is the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus. Faith will become sight. We will see Jesus and obtain the salvation of our souls. Testing and trials are inevitable while we are in this side of eternity. This side of eternity, it's going to happen. Periodically, we're going to be tried. We're going to have trials. But whenever Jesus comes back, if we can endure those trials, uh, we can face them with joy and Jesus will put an end to those. What does the following verse state about the return of Jesus? And give you who are troubled... This is in Thessalonica, where there was persecution. Give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Revealed. Um, as a side note, and I'm sure you've discovered this in your New Testament reading through it, every chapter of 1 Thessalonians end with some kind of statement about the second coming of Jesus. I love to read 1 Thessalonians just for those uh, five things that come up. It's wonderful scripture talking about what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Uh, do that sometime. Just sit down in your daily devotions and read uh, 1 Thessalonians and look towards the very end of each one of the chapters there. Whom having not seen you... You love. We haven't seen Jesus. Not one of us have seen Jesus. And yet we love Jesus anyway. Peter is telling us, remember, after the resurrection, Paul says that there were 500 Christians, or 500 people who saw Jesus raised from the dead, right? Not many people, people saw Jesus when he was alive or when he was raised from the dead. You know, uh, maybe a few thousand, and that's it. So hardly anybody has actually seen Jesus but Peter says, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Uh, I love that phrase, uh, joy inexpressible. I did a little research on that phrase so that we could uh, understand it a little bit better. Let me find it here. Sometimes I don't turn my notes as fast as I should. Um, the idea of joy inexpressible <clears throat> is the idea that there are not enough words to express what we're trying to feel. That's the idea with this. Um, can you imagine having such joy that your mouth just falls open and you can't express it? You know, we have those moments in life. Uh, our children are born. They're brand new, fresh from God, before we get them and sometimes start messing them up. <clears throat> because we're fallible human beings, right? Uh, I wish there was a manual. I thought about this last week in Martin's sermon. I wish there was a manual, Martin, that says this is how a father is supposed to do this. You know, didn't have that. Maybe some of you had better upbringing and had more of that. I don't know, but I sure wish that I'd had that manual whenever my uh, son was born. Oh, he turns 50 this year. Do I look like a person that could have a child that's 50? Don't answer that. 
Um, The participle believe here is in the present active. Present active means uh, it's linear action. It means that you begin doing something and then you continue doing something and you don't stop doing it. And so the idea here with this part, and by the way, I'll mention this a a lot in Peter. Peter uses participles a lot in his uh, writing. That's one of the ways you can tell his voice in writing is because he uses uh, so many participles. But anyway, this participle believe here um, is in present active. uh, And so it's a habitual activity, something you do continually. You have started believing in Jesus at one point and you continue to believe in him. The person exercising faith comes to Jesus with a commitment and continuous activity to rest and rely on Jesus. I like what uh, uh, the commentator Stibbs, I like the way he phrased that. And though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Peter knew that though he had seen Jesus for a very long time, nearly three years, both before and after his resurrection, Nearly every Christian in the early church, and of course now, we've not seen Jesus. We have an idea of what Jesus might look like in our minds, in our mind's eye, don't we? But we don't know what he looked like, really. And all the paintings and depictions of him, forget all that. I don't care if it's Rembrandt or who it is. You know, I just don't, I just don't like their depictions of it. We'll find out what Jesus looks like one of these days. We'll find out what Jesus looks like one of these days. Wow. We've not seen Jesus, but believe, therefore, Jesus is no less real to us, even though we've not seen him. Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those. Are y'all listening to that scripture? That's us. Blessed are We have a beatitude directed right at us as Christians. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe Jesus. We have a blessing in that passage. Isn't that wonderful? John is 20, verse 29 is a verse, by the way, provides us with a blessing. How do we receive that blessing? We receive it by this continual belief. We start it and we continue doing it. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of joy. The word translated inexpressible occurs only here in the New Testament. Peter's the only one that uses it and describes a joy so profound that it's very difficult for us to come up with the words to describe what inexpressible means. Receiving the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Don't you like that? I like the idea of an outcome. There's going to be an end to this at some time. Whether we die or Jesus comes back, there's going to be an outcome. And I'm looking forward to that outcome. Aren't you? The outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Outcome is the word uh, telos. Uh, In uh, Greek, ta telos is the actual phrase used here. It refers to the goal of our faith, which is salvation. That's what we want, isn't it? And we want to be saved. So Peter turns our attention to salvation that's in the future, which we enjoy at the present time. As long as we stay faithful, we have salvation. And at the end, that salvation is going to come to fruition. Uh, Telos is translated in chapter 3 and verse 8 to sum up. Uh, In chapter 4 and verse 9, Peter uses it to end. It refers to that by which a thing is finished, to close an issue. I love uh, Matthew 26, 58, whenever it says the outcome. I like that idea. The outcome of our faith is going to be the salvation of our souls. Jesus brings into expression three fundamental responsive activities. Number one, we hope. Hope now because we haven't seen Jesus, he hasn't been revealed. Faith now, and of course, love with joy. A little bit different from the way Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13, but very similar. Uh, So in this present life, what do we have? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We do what? Walk by, we walk by faith and not by sight, what we do. Uh, Eternal life will be ours if we continue in the faith. I I think Paul said this really well in Colossians. And by the way, I want to mention this. Whenever I underline scripture, I know it's not underlined in the Bible. I just do it for emphasis, okay? So I don't want to have to say that every time I do it. So when you see words underlined, it's not underlined in in scripture. As a matter of fact, uh, it's never underlined. 
you know. And by the way, the red or black doesn't make any difference either. <laughs> it's all the words of Jesus. Uh, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled the body of his flesh through death. Jesus died so we could be reconciled and not be alienated. Present, holy and blameless. Wow. You ever feel unworthy? I had a fellow come to me one time and sit in my office and say, I don't feel worthy enough to get on my belly and crawl around like a snake to take the Lord's Supper. He said, I feel so unworthy. And I said, you need to get up. And you need to stand up and you need to recognize because of Jesus, you are worthy. Because of him, you are worthy to take the Lord's Supper, to worship God, to sing his praises, to pray to him and have him listen to your prayers. It's not our worthiness. It's because of what Jesus has done for us and made us above reproach, continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. You've heard the gospel. You had hope in the gospel. Keep believing. Don't quit. However, it's possible for us to renounce our faith. And it's so difficult to bring this up because I have known people who quit believing. Um, they fall from a state of trust and co consecration. In other words, they fall from grace. Um, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. Please don't do that. Anyone here this morning, in the sound of my voice, don't reject Jesus. Don't reject the belief that you have in Jesus, even when trials come. Some have rejected concerning the faith and have suffered shipwreck. That word shipwreck is a really interesting word. Uh, it's metaphorical, of course, but it refers to something uh, in the old times, ships made out of wood, when they hit the reefs, they would be completely destroyed. And that's what Peter's talking about here. He says some people have destroyed their faith because they rejected Jesus. Don't do that. The danger of falling from grace is real, but I think sometimes it's misunderstood. Uh, a lot of people think of falling away as uh, somebody get, becoming very immoral. They get drunk or they commit adultery or fornication or they become a thief or a murderer. And that's what they think about somebody falling away. And yet to fall away, it can be as simply as you just stop coming to church. You stop worshiping God. You stop attending Bible study and worship. You stop fellowshipping with fellow believers. You know, the elders and Martin and I talk about your fellowshipping all the time. And it's a wonderful thing that you're fellowshipping with each other. And sometimes we have to call you to order so we can teach our class or start the worship. Because you're fellowshipping so much. But that fellowship is extremely valuable. You are talking and visiting and commiserating with people who are enjoying the same benefits and suffering the same problems that everybody else in Christianity is. Really important that we do that on a regular basis. Sometimes people stop praying and singing praises. You ever just drive along in your car and start singing a hymn? I surprise myself sometimes and I'll just start driving along and start singing. You know, something about Jesus. I don't recommend that you pray when you're driving <clears throat> unless you're going to keep your eyes open because eyes closed in driving is really a kind of a bad situation. So make sure that you uh, make sure you keep your eyes open if you're doing that. But I know people who said they've done that. Remember, we'll be saved by our continuing reliance on the grace of God. And so this morning, I beg you, don't quit believing. Don't quit doing God's will. Don't quit. Keep after it, no matter what. And if you have troubles, come forward and we'll help you. Go see an elder, they'll help you. If you're having problems and you need to talk to somebody, there are people here who will talk to you and help you. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Oh, boy. Old Testament inspired prophets wanted to understand their own prophecy. The prophets were deeply, sincerely interested in the salvation that they talked about. 
uh, these pro uh, prophets predicted God's undeserved mercy towards the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And I'm grateful because I'm a Gentile. How about you? Anybody here a converted Jew? Then we're all grateful for being Gentiles and the gospel coming to us, right? Uh, there's a lot of Old Testament passages we could use, and I've got a lot, many more written down. Uh, so he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings uh, shall shut their mouths in him for uh, what had not been told them they shall see, and they had not heard they shall consider. Isaiah 52, again in Romans 15, but as it's written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Uh, there's, I've got many more scriptures written down talking about that. This scripture in 1 Peter, I think, graphically describes the interest of the Old Testament prophets in salvation through Christ made known in the Christian dispensation. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, the prophets did not understand. They didn't see clearly. They saw, but they saw uh, kind of um, uh, like you look through certain kinds of windows that are made to obscure your vision. You can see through it, you can see something's on the other side, but you don't know really what it is. And that's exactly the way the prophets were. Any believer today is able to see very clearly what the most distinguished prophet only saw obscurely. They wanted to know. They were giving the information to us, but they never came to a complete knowledge. Jesus is the one that brought that for us. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, when I have them in parentheses there, that's a commentator that I've quoted. Okay, yeah. Ober, Stibbs, uh, Robinson, there's a, uh, about 12 or 15 different people uh, that I have used in different things that I've used. And I, when I, I try to be academically honest. That's not my statement, it's his. <laughs> uh, searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was with them indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Oh, boy. It's a lot here and we're running out of time. Uh, searching what? They're seeking to know. The prophets wanted to know. Um, in the time period preceding Jesus coming into the world, there were those who were seeking to know what God would do. What's God going to do? Even the Old Testament prophets had only a blurred vision of future events. Of what manner or time the Spirit of Christ? What person or the time of the Spirit of Christ? Jesus is God and therefore existed before the world was created, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh. Jesus was in existence before he came in flesh. Um, God is spirit. The pre-existent Christ was the one who inspired the Old Testament prophets. And I'll probably just get through this and that's it. Concerning the pre-existence of Jesus, there's five basic things to observe. Please watch this carefully. All this comes from John 1, John wonderful writer. First, his position over all creation, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Number two, his power to create all things, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, third, his providing uh, providence and controlling all things, Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Fourth, his authority over all things, Matthew 28 and verse 18, all authority has been given to me on heaven and in earth. Notice what his fifth one is, his presence in the Old Testament. I am in whom Abraham rejoiced was Jesus in John chapter 8, if you'll go back and read that. Uh, by the way, these lessons are being saved online, and you can go back and look them up, scriptures, whatever you need to do. The Lord who motivated Moses was Christ. The rock in the wilderness and the wilderness wanderings was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10. And the king of Isaiah's temple vision was the son in John chapter 12. Jesus existed before he became known to us in the flesh. Uh, it's getting into deeper theology, talking about the preexistence of Christ, but it's a very interesting study. Uh, who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The Old Testament prophets told us Jesus whoever Messiah was, was going to suffer, right? <clears throat> Uh-oh. Let me see if I can. Uh, I'm going to finish this slide, and then we'll take a request. First, God's, uh, Christ must suffer. 
Second, the suffering of Christ is the way of entrance into his glory. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2. And third, outstanding among the result of the suffering would be the extension of salvation to the Gentiles who are on the outside looking in. All right. Thank you, Brother Peter, for wonderful scripture. Uh, I love it. I love the general epistles a lot. <laughs>